Welcome aboard. This is the Admiral's Almanac, your leadership life connection, bringing leaders from all walks of life into yours so you can take charge, improve your leadership, and improve your life. With the wit and wisdom of your host, Rear Admiral Gary Hall. And welcome back to the Admiral's Almanac. I'm your host, Gary Hall. And today, I took a drive from New Braunfels, Texas, down to Corpus Christi, Texas, Corpus Christi, Texas, the sparkling city by the sea, and I've wound up at Our Lady of Corpus Christi to see one of my spiritual advisors and a great leader in the Catholic Church, Father James Kelleher. Welcome, Father Kelleher. Thank you, Gary. It's great to be on your sh- podcast today. Well, thank you. And Father Kelleher, may I call you Father Jim? Is that appropriate? Yes, Father Jim would be great. Well, Father uh, Jim and I, we met several years ago while I was working at the White House. And uh, just by happenstance, we were both on the same um, flight from Southwest Airlines. And I was A-28, and Father was A-29. And he said to me... I said, Gary, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a special assistant to the president. And And Father Jim wondered... Uh, president of what? But he figured he better not try to crack a joke here. So he said, uh, could you elaborate on that? <laughs> <laughs> and as I said, uh, I'm a special assistant to the president of the United States. And the Father Jim said, well, sit next to me on the airplane. And by the time we landed in Corpus Christi from Houston, he said, Gary, we're going to do something together. Don't know what it is. But I think let's let our let my listener know a little bit about you, Father. Okay. Where, where, where's your hometown and where did you my, start? My hometown is in Ellensburg, Washington. It's a small town of only about 12,000 people. It's right in the center of the state on the east side of the Cascade Mountains. So on the west side of my town are evergreen forests. And on the east side, it's semi arid sagebrush. So I'm right where the uh, climate changes. Uh, So Father, what kind of guy were you in high school? You look like an athlete. Well, the Kelleher brothers are very athletic, Kerry, and there's seven of them. And so we sort of honed each other's uh, athletic uh, skills. Uh, We were football and basketball players mainly. And tr- track. Okay, so uh, seven boys. Were there any sisters? In yeah, the two two sisters. Um, so it's sort of, we have my oldest brothers, Mike and Jack and Mike, and then Jolene. And then comes me with my brothers, Dan and Tom underneath. And then my sister, Katie. And then the last two are Pat and Phil. Okay, well, that, that's good to know that you remember the names of all of your <laughs> eight siblings. So my simple math, seven plus two is nine. So you must come from a strong Catholic family. Amen. Yeah, my father's name was Joseph and my mom's name was Colleen. And we were blessed because both my mom and dad had a, a strong Catholic faith and they were able to share it with us in a in a beautiful way. You know, uh, my my mom went to daily mass at six thirty in the morning. Believe it or not, Gary, she'd get up before the rest of us and go to mass. And one day, I asked her, "Why do you do that every day, Mom?" She said, "Jim, I can't get through the day unless I have Jesus in the morning." And wow, that was a pretty good witness. Well, what a part! You know, a mother has a strong, powerful influence on her son. So, where'd you go to college? Uh, I went to the University of Notre Dame. My brother Mike, who's three years older than me, he sort of paved the way there. He was he was actually a senior there when I was a freshman, and that was very fortunate, Gary, because he was an expert in calculus and chemistry, and so he helped his younger brother, you know, get through freshman calculus, and uh, he, he was amazing. He just, you know, it just came naturally to him. So at this point, you're at, at Notre Dame, a great uh, football college and a great alumni association. Uh, were you thinking about the priesthood? Well, it was sort of in the back of my mind, you know, um, and so as I started, I majored in business at Notre Dame, but I would take electives in theology. So by my junior year, you know, the question of, yeah, I might be called to be a priest was getting fairly strong, but I still went ahead in my senior year and interviewed for some accounting jobs in Los Angeles and had a few offers. So I did end up taking one of them with a company called, uh, at the time, 
Coopers and Lie brand. Now it's called Price Waterhouse Coopers. Oh wow! So and during this time, so you spent a couple of years in the accounting business, and so at that some point you decided to pursue a doctorate. Is that correct? Right. I sort of had an an unusual path, Gary, because um, when I was living in Los Angeles, I had a, a Jesuit priest who was my spiritual director, and he gave me a book on the life of Saint Ignatius of Loyola and Saint Francis Xavier. Uh, those are the two founders of the Jesuits. You know, Ignatius was the founder and uh, Xavier was like a co-founder. Well, I read their stories and it just set me on fire. And I said, that's what I want to do. So I actually ended up entering the California province of the Jesuits. But as you can see, Gary, I am not a Jesuit priest. I, you're, I, you're not, I, no, you're not a Jesuit priest. In fact, I kind of identify with Ignatius because wasn't he like a, a warrior he and was. a fighter and, you know, and um, enjoyed all the pursuits of life. And then it was, he was injured in battle and uh, uh, went to Loyola to recover. And uh, that's where he found his conversion. Amen. Yeah, it's a very powerful conversion. And so that really sort of set my heart on fire to want to do the things of God, especially uh, Xavier, who was a foreign missionary in India and Japan. So I was in the Jesuits for a number of years, but I left in theology without being ordained. And it was at that time that the Lord called me to Rome. And uh, so I, I went to Rome in uh, 1988 and began a, the studies for a doctorate in theology and eventually completed that. So, as I always say, um, a doctor of theology, that's a THD, right? Actually, they call this an STD because it's a, it's, it, the, it means a doctorate of sacred theology. And because it's a, STD is our foreign letters, it's in that order. But yeah, so it's a... There's so, there, STD or THD, it's, there's humor in there somewhere. I, I think the Scarecrow had a THD, a doctor of thinkology. But while you were there in Rome, you had an amazing encounter with a, a living saint. Tell me about that. As a layman in Rome, I, I found out that Mother Teresa had a convent of nuns um, behind the Col- Colosseum and that they would pr- have adoration every day at three o'clock. So... I started to just drop by their convent and they were very happy to have me join them for an hour of adoration. So we'd go into the chapel and kneel down and there was about 15 or 20 of them in the chapel. And of course these nuns are very, um, they're very dedicated and live a very simple life. So they don't even have chairs in their chapel. They just most of the time just kneel or sit back on their backs of their legs. But, um, so I, I was doing that and then helping them sometimes in their soup kitchen. Well, uh, one of my buddies named Michael, who was from England, he was going to be ordained by John Paul II uh, in about two weeks. I said, Michael, you got to come and pray a holy hour with the sisters. It's really beautiful. So we went over to the convent and on this particular day, we knocked on the door and this bright, um, beaming 25-year-old nun from India looks at us and I say, hi, sister, this is Deacon Michael. He's going to be ordained by the Holy Father. Could we join you for your hour of adoration today? And she looked at me and she says, oh, that's wonderful. Mother's here today. And I said to her, yeah, well, we don't really want to, didn't come to see Mother Superior. We just want to adore Jesus. And she says, oh no, Mother's here today and I'm going to go tell her. So at this point I figured out she meant Mother Teresa. So she takes us into a courtyard. Mother Teresa comes out and she spends five minutes talking with us and giving Deacon Michael some very good counsel. Now, I'm sort of Irish, so I'm a good talker, but I have to admit, I was spellbound. I could not say a word. All I could do was listen. And now, uh, when you went to Holy Hour, didn't oh, you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then what happened was uh, it was time for us to go in for the Holy Hour, and Mother had to step aside to talk to someone for a minute. So Deacon Michael and I went into the Holy Hour, and I said, I better make myself scarce here, and I'll go to the back and sit against the wall. So I was sitting against the back wall, and uh, and the Holy Hour was about to begin, and a sister came up to me. And she says, uh, you're going to have to move you're in mother's place. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're sitting in mother Teresa's, uh, uh, place at, at, um, holy hour. Yes. Yeah. So I guess at this point, is this when you've f- kind of finalized or, uh, said, okay, I'm going into the priesthood. Did, did you well, get the it, calling at that point? I didn't get it right at that point, but, um, in 1990, I did the consecration to Mary of St. Maximilian Colby. 
And that's a very powerful consecration where you basically surrender your life to Jesus through the intercession of Mother Mary. And I noticed that after that, things started moving uh, towards the priesthood because I actually had a girlfriend and things. But, um, you know, I just... I'd gone out with this one girl for a year, but then I just decided she, you know, I wasn't meant to marry her. And then after that, I I started writing the doctoral dissertation. You know, that takes a couple of years to do. So I went back to America to use their um, libraries because they're easier, more accessible than in Rome. And uh, it was why I was writing my doctorate, you know, that uh, one day the Lord just, he made the call very clear and very, very direct, direct, Gary. Wow. But anyway, the uh, consecration to Mary, that's a 33-day process. So you can, the book is available to if somebody wants to pursue that. Right, yeah. Um, the 33, it's, there's a 33-day consecration that St. Louis de Montfort developed. And uh, then St. Maximilian Colby had read that uh, consecration of St. Louis de Montfort. And he sort of developed his own version of it, but it achieves the same goal. Okay. I I have gone through that and it didn't call me to the priesthood, but my wife said when she passes, I can go into seminary. All All right. right. So I got that going for me. So so you go in uh, to the priesthood and you wind up with SALT, S-O-L-T. Can you tell me what that is? Right. Uh, That's an acronym for our society, Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. To tell you the truth, Gary, before I went to Rome to do this doctorate, I'd never heard of this society because it it was only founded in 1958. But it was while I was studying in Rome that I met a seminarian in this society. And the founder of the Society of Our Lady is Father James Flanagan. And in my second, towards the end of my first year in Rome, he he came to Rome to visit his seminarian. So I actually got to meet with him an hour and I found out that he was, he'd actually gone to the University of Notre Dame and played football there. Oh, wow. Yeah, so we hit it off. But even though we hit it off, I still wasn't quite ready to go to a seminary. God had to, you know, prepare me just a little bit more another year or two. You know, uh, talking about callings, uh, I mean, was it a spiritual moment or was it uh, just a a series of a culmination of different experiences? Yeah, what it was, it, it all sort of caught me off guard because... After I'd left the Jesuits, I determined that I'd go and get a doctorate in theology, be a university professor, and get married. So I was well on my way to get this doctorate, and I did have a girlfriend in Rome. But, you know, after discernment and everything, I decided, you know, this wasn't quite the right, she's a beautiful woman and everything, but wasn't the right one for me to marry. And uh, when I came back to America and was writing my doctorate, one day I just was sitting in an easy recliner chair and on the table coffee table was a new testament i just picked up that new testament gary and i uh i usually don't do this but it just happened this way i said to the lord lord it's time to settle this question about the seminary so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this new testament i'm going to open it i'm going to close my eyes and point to a verse and if the word priest is is um in that verse, I'm seriously going to pursue entering a seminary. And if the word priest is not in that verse, I'm never going to think about it again. Now, Gary, I thought I had this experiment pretty well weighted in my <laughs> favor. <laughs> <laughs> so I opened the New Testament with my eyes closed, put it into a verse. For those who are listening, get your New Testament out and read Romans chapter 15, verses 15 and 16, and find out what happened to Jim Keller on that day. The Lord, he uh, he took me to a verse with the word priest in it, but it not only had the word priest in it, it also was talking about St. Paul's call to be a priest and to be a priest bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Oh, wow. Yeah, so he not only put the word priest in there, but he gave me my mission. Like, my mission is to the Gentiles. Like, I'm in a missionary order, and I... T- the Holy Spirit moves me around a lot to different states and countries like Ireland, England, Central America. All of them have good golf courses, though. Uh, yeah, the the most famous one is in Belize. 
you have to have a machete to be able to play that course. <laughs> I say that because uh, besides his uh, rosary and his Bible, his car has his set of golf clubs and shoes ready to go. They're ready. So uh, tell me a little bit about uh, we're sitting here at Our Lady of Corpus Christi. Um, how did the, what's, what's the story behind this uh, chapel? For those of you that don't know, it's a beautiful uh, chapel, and it's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week uh, adoration chapel. Yeah, what happened, Gary, was uh, our founder, Father Flanagan, had a vision of Jimmy, so he says, Father Jimmy, you better get down here uh, to Corpus Christi. I say, why, Father? He says, well, you know that chapel you wanted to, I mean, that uh, college you wanted to found? I go, yeah. He says, there's people here. They want to give you land and buildings for that. I said, you're kidding me. Who who in Corpus Christi would be able to do that? But I came down and <clears throat> the current property of Our Lady of Corpus Christi used to be a diocesan retreat center. And before that, it was a Benedictine Boys High School. Well, the bishop at the time in 1997 was Bishop Roberto Gonzalez, a little five foot, five inch Franciscan from Boston. And he didn't see a need for his diocese to uh, keep utilizing this retreat center. And so he, he'd heard that the Society of Our Lady wanted to found a college. And uh, the thing is, is that there's a, a restrictive deed on this land. It, uh, when the donor gave it in 1930, 80 acres, there was a, de- a restriction that said it always has to be used for Catholic education. So the bishop, although he wanted to sell the land, he couldn't because you know, the donor's grandchildren said, if you sell this, we get all the money. So he said, well, the Society of Our Lady wants to found a college, go talk to them. And and if they will do it, we'll give them the land and buildings. And so that's what happened. Oh, wow. So um, SALT is headquartered here, or his uh, office is here. Right. And uh, um, whatever happened to the college portion? Well, um, Father Flanagan and I, uh, he was the founder with me and Father Tony. So I was the president. Father Tony was the vice president. The interesting thing about it was all three of us had gone to Notre Dame. And so the college got off to a pretty good start. And then the Holy Spirit gave me a passion to want to build a new chapel because the current chapel only holds 40 people. So I had to go talk to Bishop Roberto again and uh, you know to build a chapel. But f- there was a preceding event that made that possible was I flew back east to go to a, a national uh, Marino Movement priest retreat and a, a businessman picked me up at the airport and I gave him a gold miraculous medal and it, and then he took me to the retreat and then he took me back to the airport at the end of the retreat and be, but in the he showed me his business and had a, over 300 employees well anyway uh, we exchanged business cards well, three months later, he called me up on the phone and he said, Father, how's your college doing? And I said, well, it's doing okay. We're doing this, this, and this. And he says, you're doing anything else? And I said, I saw the opportunity to give the vision for the chapel. So I says, well, we want to build a world-class chapel of perpetual adoration, built in the shape of a cross with a 75-foot blue dome with gold stars, representing Our Lady of Guadalupe, star of the new evangelization. It will be Spanish colonial architecture and it will hold 250 people. And a typical Midwest accent goes, anybody helping you with that, Father? And I go, no, we're real poor and no one is. And so he flew me to Mother Angelica's world-class church. And while we were looking at that church on Saturday night, we're walking back to where we're staying. He goes, Father, you know that chapel you want to build? And I said, yeah. He said, that's from God. I said, it is? He goes, yeah. And God's given me all the means to pay for all of the architectural work for that chapel. And I'm going to do it. And I said, you are? He said, yes, I am. Well, a week later, he sent me a little card in the mail. And inside the card, there was a folded check, Gary. I looked at that check for about five minutes. I didn't know if it was going to be for $500 or $5,000. I can tell you it was a lot more than 5,000. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, well, if anybody visits Corpus Christi, you need to come, no matter whether you're Catholic, Protestant, uh, Jewish, Baptist, uh, Muslim, you need to come to Our Lady of Corpus Christi and come to the Adoration Chapel and see this beautiful business uh, building. 
Now, th this podcast really is about leadership, and I think you've demonstrated tremendous leadership by having a compelling vision and then being able to communicate that vision. And then with the Holy Spirit, the check uh, showed up with the money. That's absolutely fantastic. But now I want to shift gears here a little bit. Uh, for those that are listening, uh, we said uh, three decades of the rosary as we started this, uh, before we started this recording. Father Jim is known, you're known as the rosary priest. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm sort of like the junior rosary priest. The real rosary priest is Father Patrick Payton. He did rosary crusades all over the year, all over the world from 1940 to 1985. <clears throat> and uh, so he's the famous rosary priest. I'm just sort of like the little rosary priest, you know, promoting the rosary around America, Ireland, England, and Central America. But... Uh, Tell me a little bit about your rosary crusades. You say you're the little rosary priest, but haven't you had stadiums filled with... Uh, tell me about your uh, yeah, yeah. rosary crusades, some of them. Well, remember that meeting that I had with Mother Teresa at her convent, right? Well, I went to a mass a, a year later, and she was there, and she gave me a miraculous medal. And um, so for some reason, God had me close to Mother Teresa, so... On October 19, 2003, she was uh, beatified, and I got to go to that beatification. And um, <clears throat> uh, some of my Dallas friends and American friends got to go to that too. And after the beatification was over, we had a dinner at a famous piazza, Piazza, uh, oh gosh, I remember, Piazza Navona in the center of Rome. Well, over the dinner, we decided to do something in honor of Mother Teresa because it was the day she was beatified. We said, what did she like? She loved the rosary. What else was she devoted to? To Jesus in the Eucharist. So we decided to found an organization called Eucharistic Family Rosary Crusade that would promote, you know, devotion to the Eucharist and devotion to Our Lady in the Rosary. And we just sort of had a general idea of what we would do. Well... That was October 19, 2003. I like to say that Mother Teresa moves pretty fast because a year later in September of 2004, I was at the home of a wealthy Dallas couple. Their first names are Don and Eleanor. And I was promoting, they invited me to a luncheon where they had 10 of their friends there. And <clears throat> I was giving the vision for the Russian mission because we were founding a mission in Russia. And I was raising some money for that. And in the middle of this luncheon, I said to Don and everybody there, I said, you know, the Russian mission, it's, it's a really good mission. I said, but do you want to hear something really exciting? And they said, yeah. And so I said, well, imagine Friday night, May 13th, the Dallas Cotton Bowl. Bishop Charles Grauman leads a Eucharistic procession of 300 people onto the field. He places Jesus on an elevated altar on the 50-yard line. Tens of thousands of people worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace. We'll build the largest rosary in the world, 60 yards long with three foot diameter Hail Mary beads. And we'll have people from all over the world be living beads of a global living rosary. And they'll say the first half of their Hail Marys in their native language. And the rest of the stadium will say the second half in English. And then I just stopped. And everybody around the table pointed their finger at me and they said, Father, that's what we want to do. <laughs> Gary, I was in trouble, man. They were believing the vision more than I was. <laughs> well, that's, again, um, even business uh, experts and academics say creating a compelling vision and then communicating that vision. And so two times you were very specific in your vision. And I think also for uh, the young people out there that are setting goals, you have to be very specific yes. uh, in your in your goals, not just in your faith life, but in your um, secular business life and family life. So, wow, that, that crusade then happened? Yeah, what happened, remember, this was Don's house. I was sitting at one end of the table. He was sitting at the other. And so I looked at Don and I says, well, Don, if we're going to do this, you have to be the president of our executive team. And he looks at me and he goes, sure, father, I'll do that. Well, his wife, Eleanor, just about fell off her chair. <laughs> but the bottom line was nine months later, May 13th, 2005, we were in the Dallas Cotton Bowl at five o'clock with the largest rosary in the world built around the altar. And the gates were going to open in an hour at six. And Don walked up to him and he says, I was on the 50 yard line. He walked out onto the field and he says, Father, how many people are coming tonight? And I said, Don, 
I have no idea. And he goes, neither do I. <laughs> so we didn't know if there's going to be 1,000, 3,000, 4,000, but the gates open. They just flooded in and 22,000 people came to the Cotton Bowl that night. Wow, 22,000 to witness uh, a living rosary. Again, the results of a clear vision and communicating the vision. Now, I mentioned that uh, we met on the Southwest Airlines and uh, you said, um, Gary, how are you getting to your destination? I said, my brother-in-law is picking me up. He said, well, can your brother-in-law give me a ride <laughs> home? And uh, we said, sure. So we saw my brother-in-law and I said, hey, can you give Father Jim a ride home? And you didn't. we didn't just drop you off. You dragged us into the chapel. You That's gave right. us all miraculous medals and uh, you had us hooked. And so after a little bit of time passed, uh, Father Jim and I spoke and he said, Gary, I now know what we want to do together. We want to get the... Holy Rosary in the hands of men and women in our military because it's the greatest uh, weapon, weapon for peace. And so off we go on a slow mission, but it's a, a growing mission. It is. Of, of the Rosary. Yeah, it's really beautiful, uh, Gary, because uh, you see, if you go back to Fatima, you know, on uh, May 13th, 1917, when the Virgin Mary appeared to the three little shepherd children, she told them to pray the rosary every day for world peace and so that World War I would come to an end. So now, over 100 years later, the Holy Spirit and Our Lady are asking you and me to put rosaries into the hand of military personnel so that they can pray for peace, right? And, and you know, because that's the first job of the military is to ensure the peace, right? And so it's sort of beautiful that, well, we're called it, to do this. It's not. It wouldn't just be for world peace, but for peace in their their lives. Now, yeah. I, I, I uh, didn't grow up as a Catholic. I became a Catholic uh, later in life, and I thought that rosaries were only said by little short women in black dresses with black lace doilies on their head. I thought that's the only person that said a rosary. But then I was at a um, backyard barbecue with uh, uh, four or five other naval officers. And the host said, do you want a beer? Do you want a beer? Went around the circle. And one gentleman said, I need to, I can't have a beer because I keep track of my beers, my rosaries, and my workouts. And this guy was a studly naval officer. And, and I called him up the next day and I said, I thought only little old ladies said rosaries. And he goes, no, Gary, I say a rosary every day for my academy classmates who have children of autism. And so I said, so men can say the rosary? Wow. So that's when that's I started powerful. going to Amazon, going to getting rosary books, getting a rosary, and I started. So what, but what is, a, for those unfamiliar, what is a rosary, Father? Well, I think to explain what a rosary is, it's good to talk about how the rosary was given by the Virgin Mary to St. Dominic way back in the early 1200s. St. Dominic was the founder of the Dominicans, and he was trying to convert these really hardcore heretics in southern France who could at times be violent, but he wasn't making any progress. So he said, I've got to spend some time in prayer. So he went and took three days of prayer and fasting in the forest. And towards the end of this time of prayer and fasting, the Virgin Mary actually appeared to him and said, Dominic, you're relying too much on yourself. You have to preach the mysteries of the rosary. And then these heretics will convert. So, and the Virgin Mary showed him what the mysteries were, their names and everything. And so he went back to, to those heretics, began preaching the mysteries of the rosary, and they began converting back to Catholicism. So that's why the Dominicans are known as the great promoters of the rosary. And so the rosary, in the, when we pray the rosary, John Paul II says we contemplate the the face and the life of Jesus through the eyes of Mary. So we're going through the mystery of Jesus being conceived in Mary's womb, being born. We're going through Jesus' public life, you know, his first miracle at the wedding feast of Cana. We're going through his passion and death and then his resurrection. So when you pray the rosary and I pray the rosary, we're actually walking with Jesus through his life. And Jesus is teaching us the meaning of those mysteries and Jesus is empowering us 
to follow him. And that's what a disciple does, is follows Jesus. Now, there are some, mostly non-Catholics, I would say, maybe some Catholics, that think it's just a mindless, repetitive prayer. But how do we explain that it isn't mindless, repetitive prayer? Right. Um, You know, think of marathon runners. Those guys run 26 miles, and guess what? First, they lift their right foot and extend. Then they lift their left foot and extend. They do that for 26 miles. Wow, why do they just keep repeating that over and over? Uh, (laughs) Well, you see, there's a rhythm to a marathon marathon runner, and there's a rhythm to the rosary and praying the Our Fathers and the Hail Marys. So when you pray in Our Father, you're acknowledging God is your Father and that you desire to do His will and that you acknowledge that He has forgiven you your sins, so you and I must forgive others their sins against us. And also in the Our Father, we ask the Father to give us our daily bread. We need the Father's help every day. When we pray the Hail Mary, the Hail Mary is actually a very scriptural prayer because it comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. You know, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. That's all from that Gospel. And it's sort of beautiful when you think about it because... It says, the, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Yes, the Lord is within her womb, right? And blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. So in that one little part of that Hail Mary, you're proclaiming the gospel that Mary gave birth to Jesus. And then we say in the second part, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now. So whether you're 10 years old, 30 years old, 70 years old, Mary prays for us now. So you're receiving actual graces every time you say a Hail Mary. And so there's a rhythm to it. And you think about the mystery. You talk to the Lord a little bit about your life. You know, like say, for instance, you're going through a marriage problem. Well, when you're praying the Hail Mary, you give your spouse to Jesus through Mary And you give Jesus permission to heal your marriage. And once you've given him permission, he will go into action to heal your marriage. And he'll make you part of the solution. But you have to obey what he says to do. Yeah, that's that's the hard part. But we'll get to that. So I look at it as a rosary is physical, verbal, and spiritual. Exactly. It's, it's verbal prayer, mental prayer. It's physical of holding the, the rosary in our hands. And, and I think what we're trying to do with the military is get them corded rosaries, yes. which are handmade rosaries, which have no metal parts. So it's easy to put into a uniform, easy to go through security and scanners and that. So what are the, um, you said uh, that Mary appeared and gave... Um, uh, Dominic mysteries. What are what are mysteries? Okay. Well, the Virgin Mary gave Dominic fifteen mysteries. So one set of mysteries are the five joyful mysteries. That's the early life of Jesus, his conception in the womb of Mary at the Annunciation, Mary's visitation to Elizabeth to help with baby John, and then the third one is the birth of Jesus. The fourth one is when Joseph and Mary take baby Jesus to the temple to be consecrated to God. And then the fifth one is the finding of Jesus in the temple. So that's the joyful mysteries. The second set of mysteries that she gave Dominic were the sorrowful mysteries. And the first one is Jesus's agony in the garden. The second one is his scourging at the pillar. The third one was when the soldiers made a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and mocked him. And the fourth one was Jesus carries his cross. And the fifth one is Jesus dies on the cross for your sins and mine. So those are the five sorrowful. And then the five glorious are, the first one is the resurrection. Jesus rises from the dead on the third day, opens the gates of heaven. The second one is he ascends into heaven and gives the apostles the commission to go and make disciples of all nations. The third one is the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the Virgin Mary and the apostles where the church is born visibly on earth. And the apostles are empowered with supernatural faith and courage to go forth and preach the gospel uh, throughout the world. And then the fourth one is the assumption of Mary into heaven because she was conceived without sin. When her earthly life came to an end, God took her body and soul to heaven 
because her body was perfectly made. It had never been touched by sin. She had never committed sin. So she was ready to go body and soul to heaven. When you and I die, if we live, if we follow Jesus and we merited going to heaven, our soul goes to heaven, but our body will not rise until the final judgment when it then be a, uh, a, a, glorified body that will be reunited with our soul. And then the fifth glorious mystery is the coronation of Mary, queen of heaven and earth. She reigns over heaven and earth with her son, Jesus. Now, so those are the 15 mysteries. And for uh, 800 years, that's how many mysteries we had. But then we, Gary, in the year 1978, a man from a far country named Karol Wojtyla was elected Pope. I re- I remember I remember it because that took um, to pick that pope wasn't there many many votes and we were all waiting. I was a Lutheran at the time and I was waiting for the white smoke. Exactly. And do you know where when I heard the news of who was elected, the first time it was announced, they said that an African had been elected pope because no one could pronounce his name. And then twenty minutes later, it said, "Oh no, that was a mistake. He's not an African. He's, He's Polish." Polish. <laughs> 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 and like you, he was a, a tremendous um, athlete, and now he is St. John Paul the um, the Second, and he gave us the luminous mystery. Right, because early on in his pontificate, unabashedly, he said that the rosary was his favorite prayer. He prayed it every day, multiple times a day. And so in the year 2002, he wrote a apostolic exhortation on the rosary, and in that exhortation, he introduced the five luminous mysteries or the five mysteries of light, which are the public life of Jesus. So his baptism in the Jordan, his first miracle at Cana, his proclamation of the gospel and many of his healing miracles. Then the fourth mystery is the transfiguration. And then the fifth one is his institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. Well, those are the perfect uh, additions to the mysteries so that you yeah. ta- it takes you through the entire life of uh, Christ and, and beyond. And so um, it's beautiful. So for those that think that uh, the rosary is just a uh, repetitive, non-thinking uh, prayer, it is, is so much more. And, and I will have to um, uh, testify that uh, I started doing the rosary and... I didn't do it perfectly to start, and I don't even know if I do it perfectly now, but is it a requirement that you get it all right? You don't have to do it perfectly because our, the Virgin Mary makes up for us, right? Because she's praying with us, and she always pr- prays perfectly. So she's looking at her heart. Jesus is looking at her heart. You know, we just say, Jesus, I want to be with you. I want to let you draw me closer to you. Teach me more about you Teach me, Jesus, how to follow you, love you, love my neighbor. And it's a great adventure. You know, it's a a great great adventure. So if you're a child, if you just say a Hail Mary, that's your start of a rosary. Exactly. And then uh, if you're a grown man like me, if you can just say a decade before an important meeting or uh, before an operation, before you take off from the flight deck, uh, um, it makes a difference. It sure does. um, And I I will testify, I don't know if I had a um, mystical experience saying the rosary, but I was uh, sitting on a bench um, alongside the Potomac River at National Defense University. And I was praying a rosary uh, for the protection of my children. Beautiful. And all of a sudden, I felt large uh, wings or something engulf me and squeeze me uh, wow. tight. And Beautiful. I, I, so I, cl- I closed my eyes. I kept saying my rosary, and I was crying, full on crying. Wow. And uh, um, I- I'm having to think that that was. Uh, that's a, yeah, that's a super grace given to you by God, Gary. So I, I've been blessed. And as I said, every um, sinner starts off as a saint. And I laid a good foundation from which to <laughs> launch. So I very uh, appreciate it. So now, um, if you're given a rosary, does it need to be blessed? or Yes, it- yes, it should be blessed because then it becomes a sacramental. And uh, uh, yeah, so get, have your rosary blessed. And any priest can do that, yeah, right? Yeah, any priest can bless your rosary. So... 
okay, so I'm listening to this podcast and I've been uh, hooked and I haven't turned it off as, oh my God, I don't want to listen to this uh, dogma or whatever. How do I get started in a, in a rosary? What okay. should I Okay, well, the first thing, you know, you, you, you get, you have, someone gives you a rosary, you buy a rosary, have the priest bless it. And then on today, you can simply say into Google, the words how to pray the rosary and up will pop a website that'll teach you how to pray it, you know, because the beginning of the rosary, you say the apostles creed, then the, you say one, our father, three Hail Marys and glory be. And then you begin the first mystery and every mystery consists of one, our father, 10 Hail Marys and a glory be. And during that time, you, um, you listen to, uh, or during that time you contemplate the mystery, right? And uh, so there's little pamphlets that can help you do this. And uh, uh, and then the little pamphlets oftentimes will have a, a, an image, you know, of the mystery, like an image of the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary. So if you have one of those little pamphlets, that can help you too. Yeah. So if you're wearing the uniform of our nation or the spouse or the child or the parent of somebody in the military, contact us. And uh, you can contact me through my website. And we want to get rosaries to our men and women uh, in uniform. Even having it present on them can uh, uh, be a protection for them. Exactly. And for those in the military that are already praying the rosary and are quite familiar with it, if you want to help Gary and I and the rest of our team share this rosary with others, uh, contact Gary and ask him for 10, 20, 50, or even a hundred rosaries, depending on how uh, pleasantly aggressive you are in sharing this gift with others. Yeah, and don't be afraid to uh, share it. And um, I think uh, the father and I have met um, a dozen or so young men and women uh, naval aviators uh, that are praying the rosary in their 20s. And wow, that is a powerful sight to really um, behold. And uh, um, I said, just lead your life as uh, Catholic gentle people. And that's by um, being open and honest and uh, uh, living their life in a, in a way that others want to be like you. So yes. So let's get those. Help us get those rosaries out to our men and women in uniform. This is a, a ministry that is um, authorized by the Archdiocese of the Military Service uh, Bishop Archbishop uh, Brolio, who he himself carries the corded rosary uh, with him uh, daily and finds that it's a very powerful prayer. And again. Children, men, women, young and old can all benefit from the rosary. But earlier you mentioned uh, that you gave a gold miraculous medal to uh, um, a benefactor. Right. Now, so what the heck is a miraculous medal? Okay, well, the origin of the miraculous medal, we have to go back to November 27th, 1830, when the Virgin Mary appeared to a 24-year-old nun in Paris, France, named St. Catherine Labouré. Now, the big question is, what did the Virgin say to St. Catherine? She said, have a medal made that looks like this, and those who wear it with faith will receive many graces. So, of course, St. Catherine had the medal made, right? And many people began to wear the medal and asking Mary to pray with them to Jesus. Well, Gary, all these miracles and conversions started happening in Paris, so the people gave it a nickname. What do they nickname it? The Miraculous Medal. What's the real name of that medal? Well, the Virgin had a prayer written around the outside of the medal, which says, O oh Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. So that's an affirmation of her Immaculate Conception, right? O oh Mary, conceive without sin. So the official title of that medal is the Immaculate Conception, but the nickname is the Miraculous Medal. And now, um, so Catherine became St. Catherine. Right. And uh, 75 years after her death, her body was exhumed and it was incorrupt. Yes, it's, it's a miracle. And if you go to her chapel in Paris, France, it's at 140 Rue de Bac, right in the center of Paris. Beautiful chapel there. Under the main altar is, you can see through the glass, her incorrupt body. Wow. It's amazing. That will be a destination, our next uh, trip to um, Paris. Yes. So, well, again, this is a leadership um, 
podcast, but uh, I call this Leading with the Holy Spirit. And you can see that uh, Father Jim has had uh, um, a tremendous, compelling uh, vision and ability to articulate that vision. And then the other thing which I want to point out is uh, you're always building these teams. Amen. And uh, he's not bashful about putting his arm around your head, giving you head noogies and saying <laughs> you're, you're on the team. Um, but so, and that's right down the line of good business practices. And that is creating a vision, um, communicating the vision, building a team, getting early wins. And we've been getting early wins with our rosary distribution, uh, rinse and uh, repeat. Amen. And so as we grow, yes. grow our, our uh, teams. Yes. And Gary, if I could put in a word, you know, Padre Pio was one of the greatest proponents of the rosary. He he prayed more than 10 rosaries a day, more than 10. And uh, I'm going to be doing a retreat, a 24-hour retreat on Padre Pio here at Our Lady of Corpus Christi starting uh, at 5 p.m. on Friday, February 4th and ending 24 hours later at 5 p.m. on Saturday, February 5th. So if anyone would like to come on this retreat, you just go to our Lady of Corpus Christi website and uh, you go to the retreats where you can push the retreat button and sign up for this retreat. But it'd be great to have a lot of people on this retreat. Well, and if uh, we don't get this podcast out by February 4th, <laughs> go to uh, just Google Our Lady of Corpus Christi um, Adoration Chapel and you'll look for Father Jim Kelleher and you can communicate to us about rosaries in miraculous medals through that or um, go to my webpage uh, um, where you got this podcast and send me an email. So final thoughts, Father, as we wrap this up, do you want to give us a blessing or do you want to give us a, a uh, prayer? Yeah, that, uh, I'd like to share a prayer with you, Gary, and all the listening audience. It's one of my favorite prayers. It's a prayer to the Holy Spirit. And it, I prayed this prayer a lot when I was writing my 350-page doctorate because I had that half the time I didn't know where to go next. And I'd pray this prayer and the Holy Spirit would give me a book or an idea or have someone give me encouragement. So um, I'll say the words and then Gary, you and the audience can repeat it. And when I'm speaking, you're listening to the Holy Spirit. And when you repeat it, I'm trying to listen to the Holy Spirit. If you practice this prayer daily, you will find the Holy Spirit giving you a lot of inspirations, giving you a lot of images that will help you to do the right thing that he wants you to do now. So let's begin. O Holy Spirit. O Holy Spirit. Soul of my soul. Soul of my soul. I worship and adore you. I worship and adore you. Enlighten and guide. Enlighten and guide. Strengthen and console me. Strengthen and console me. Tell me what I ought to do. Tell me what I ought to do. And command me to do it. And command me to do it. I promise to be submissive. I promise to be submissive. In everything you permit to happen to me. In everything you permit to happen to me. Only show me what is your will. Only show me what is your will. Amen. Amen. And then I'll well, give everybody a blessing, okay? All right. So, Lord Jesus, I entrust Gary and all the listening audience to you through the loving hands of Mary. We ask through Mary's powerful intercession that each and every one of you may cooperate with these special graces that Jesus is offering to pray the rosary every day, to contemplate the life and face of Jesus through the eyes of Mary, to allow Jesus to bring you into deep communion with him and to empower you and me to be his disciples. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father James Kelleher, a member of the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity here at Our Lady of Corpus Christi in Corpus Christi, Texas. A man who leads with faith, leads with the Holy Spirit, and again, takes his Notre Dame business degree and uses it for, uh, for his faith and for Jesus Christ. Thank you very much for being on the show, Father Jim. Thank you, Gary. It's been a real delight. What a great episode with Father James Kelleher. What were the leadership lessons we learned? First, create a compelling vision. Have a detailed vision. Communicate that vision. Build a team and execute. Father Jim has done that in all aspects of his uh, Catholic and academic life. If you want to learn more about the rosary, 
or any other questions on the Catholic faith, go to catholic.com and search for your questions. Again, a great episode with Father Jim. So until we meet again, here's wishing you a happy voyage home.